This Birding Adventures episode is powered by Nikon, your world leader in optics since 1917, and sponsored in part by Tourism Northern Territory, Australia's Outback. Air travel provided by Qantas, the spirit of Australia. Welcome to Northern Territory, Australia. We're at the top end of Northern Territory in a beautiful part of the countryside. This place, Northern Territory, has got such diversity from desert in the red center right up to tropical monsoon forest here in the top end. Northern Territory also has a whole array of wildlife it's got some of the best barramundi fishing in the world. And on this show, we're going in quest of our golden bird, the rainbow pitter. Let's go birding. This is the perfect habitat for this bird. Beautiful plumes. Look at the plumes on the neck and the head. Yeah! That's what I call birding. Awesome. That's our golden bird. If you have a bucket list of places you'd like to see in the world, the top end of Northern Territory has to be on that list. This place has such amazing diversity from beautiful beaches to monsoon forests to lotus carpets of flowers, to shimmering waterfalls, and abundant wildlife and bird life. This place has it all, the top end of Northern Territory, Australia. Our adventure to the top end of Northern Territory, Australia began with a flight from Alice Springs in the Red Centre right up to Darwin, where we met with our local guide, Andy Mortimer. Welcome to the top end of the Northern Territory of Australia. Let's go birding. We didn't even get a chance to drop our bags and headed straight off to Buffalo Creek, one of the better birding spots close to Darwin to go and see what species we could find. This area is excellent because it's got these huge coastal tidal mudflats. It's got coastal monsoon forest. It's also got excellent mangrove habitat. It was quite stunning arriving in this destination and seeing 30 or 40 species of birds in half an hour. Some of these birds look significantly different from their conspecifics further south. The rainbow lorikeets of the top end, for example, have a dark orange rather than a green collar. Other parrots that we came across were the ubiquitous galahs, magnificent red-winged parrots, and the typically nervous varied lorikeets. However, due to these flowering gums, these birds were uncharacteristically confiding, and we had awesome close-up views. Rainbow bee-eaters, forest, and sacred kingfishers were in abundance. As well as the more common species of honey eaters like brown honey eater, we also spotted two really range restricted honey eaters, the spectacularly beautiful red headed honey eater and a pair of rufous banded honey eaters at the nest. The largest of the honey eaters are the bizarre and freaky fryer birds and three of the four species occur here in the top end, like this silver crown fryer bird. One of the more common species at Buffalo Creek is the fig bird, which depends upon both an insect and a tree for its survival. One of the dominant trees in this monsoon forest is the cluster fig. Now there are over 900 species of figs worldwide. And also there are 900 species of fig wasps. Fig wasp and fig fruit ecology is something to behold. This fig fruit here is actually not a fruit at all. It is a fleshy flower that is inverted on itself. So all the stamens and the ova are on the inside of this fleshy flower. And there's a tiny, tiny hole at the base of every fig fruit. And in that, the female will go through that tiny hole, the female fig wasp. She'll often break off her wings and her legs trying to get in there. And then she'll find the base of one of the ova inside this inverted flower where she will lay her eggs. 
Those eggs will hatch into baby male and female fig wasps. And the male's sole function in life is to hatch from those eggs and rape the newly hatched females. He then dies inside the fig fruit and the newly impregnated females make their way through that same tiny little hole out into the outside world where they'll fly to another fig tree and in so doing cross-pollinate the fig. If we were to lose one species of fig tree, we would lose an entire species of fig wasp and vice versa. Fig trees are the dominant trees in this monsoon forest and they attract a whole variety of birds. Birds like fig birds. As well as the common bar-shouldered doves, the Buffalo Creek area also holds some range-restricted dove species, like the giant Teresian imperial pigeons. Shining flycatchers were flitting about in the canopy, and whilst watching these active birds, we spotted a rare resident of the top end, the Pacific Baza or Crested Hawk. Like the similar cuckoo hawks of Africa, these bazas feed predominantly on insects, and we were treated to excellent views of one dissecting a large mantis-like insect. We then headed to Fog Dam, about an hour's drive from Darwin, where we went in quest of our golden bird, the Rainbow Pitta. But before we went looking for the bird, we came across a whole diversity of different bird species at Fog Dam, one of the better birding sites in the Northern Territory. There was an abundance of bird life, from jabiru storks to birdican ducks, and even to the tiny but beautiful crimson finch. We're going to be coming out here later with Andy to look for some of the nocturnal creatures and birds of this area. What really blows my mind about this particular wetland behind me is that one square kilometer of area here can hold up to a ton of snakes. There is a higher density of snakes here than anywhere else in the world. This Birding from the Edge segment is brought to you by Nikon, manufacturers of the Edge line of optics. There's nothing better than after a day's hard birding to cool off in stunning rock pools in Litchfield National Park. It was the end of the rainy season, so these rock pools were actually connected by flowing water and it was just amazing to sit there and have a little bit of downtime after some seriously hard birding. This is Birding from the Edge. From South Australia, to the Red Centre to Northern Territory, Australia is jam-packed full of reptiles. We were fortunate enough in Northern Territory to come across Merton's water monitors and other fascinating reptiles. This is the fantastic frilled lizard of the Northern Territory of Australia. They've got these beautiful frilled necks which they'll use as a threat display but also as a communication tool between lizards in these trees. What's quite interesting about these lizards is that they're fairly common, but very little is known about their life biology from when they are tiny till when they are about half the size of this guy over here. It's believed that when they hatch, they climb to about three to four feet off the ground. They hang out there for a day or two, and then they disappear for about five years, possibly in the canopy of eucalyptus gums and other forest type trees and then at about five years old, they're seen again, they come down to about this kind of level. Nearly entirely arboreal, they will go down to the ground to obviously get from tree to tree, but this is a fantastic lizard of the Northern Territory, the frilled lizard. After a fruitless search for the rainbow pitta on our first afternoon, we headed out with Andy on a night tour to experience some of the extraordinary night animals of the area around Fog Dam. We're on our way to Fog Dam. <laughs> we'll go for a bit of a drive out tonight. Um, probably cover about 70 k's, I suppose. And, um, we're just looking on the uh, electric wires and for owls and on the road. Owls, night jars. We've uh, just seen a barn owl already. We'll probably have about 15 in the next few kilometers. Driving along with Andy, we've come across a barking owl next to the road. Now, a barking owl is called a barking owl because of the call that it makes. It sounds like two dogs barking. The male's call is a lot deeper. It's kind of a, 
and the females call us a woo woo and they duet like this throughout the evening. What's interesting about barking owls is that they're one of the few owls that will roost not just together in a pair, but they'll roost communally, sometimes three or four of them together in a roost during the day. Really neat to see these awesome owls out here in the Australian bush close to Darwin, the barking owl. Uh, bush thickney, bush stone curlew, I think they call them technically these days. Horrible plaintive cry to them, the wailing sound they make. When they've got their chicks, they've got a bad habit. They feign wounded, so they flap around and try and uh, get you to go away from the chicks. But uh, if they're on the road like this fellow and they've got young and they do that, the young are instinctually just crouch down and stop until the mother or father comes back. It can be their undoing. We'll head out to Scott's Creek now eh? and uh, we'll have a look for some bile snakes perhaps. Um, there should be a few trying to go upstream into the billabongs at this time of year. They, um, they uh, come down into the bigger rivers in the wet season and then head up into the uh, vegetated billabongs for the dry season. After some cool nocturnal birding, we arrived at Scott's Creek and began looking for the aquatic file snakes. Jeez, look how big that thing is. Look at that snake. They're called a file snake because if you look at that skin, they've got this very rough skin, kind of like a file to the touch. But look at those intricate markings. Black on a rufous with a pale underbelly. They get up to about a meter and a half, about five foot in length and quite thick. You can see this guy's coming out again over here, burrowing in between the rocks. So it's not quite at its primer here at the moment. The file snakes can be a lot, lot more than we're seeing tonight. Last year, this whole pool, which is probably, I don't know, an Olympic-sized swimming pool, um, you, could, you couldn't see the water for fish, literally. It was boiling fish. And uh, in amongst it, you got all the file snakes just swirling around, gorging themselves getting fat. Now a large file snake will easily swallow a catfish this size. You can see this is quite big and you can see the spines on this catfish. A lot of snakes, including pythons, will swallow prey that's really big for them. In fact, pythons will swallow antelope. The horns will stick right out of their bodies. Very strong digestive fluids in snake stomachs that are able to digest the prey. And horns, in the case of pythons, will just drop out and the wound will heal over, and in the case of file snakes, exactly the same. The rest of the fish will just be digested in the stomach, and the spines will just fall out of the snake once it's finished digestion. Leaving the file snakes, we made our way to Fog Dam itself, where we immediately came across a young saltwater croc, or salty. And 50 meters later, a baby freshwater croc. Oh, freshwater croc. Day or night, Fog Dam always produces the goods. Yeah, this is what we do in the top end for extreme sports. Hang on as long as you can. He's been on about 300 kilometres now. A speed limit of about 130 in the Northern Territory. We're doing, what, 80 kilometres an hour now? What's that in miles per hour? 60. Wind in his hair. Hang on, little buddy. This is Fog Dam behind me, one of the better birding spots close to Darwin. This entire wetland behind me is a failed rice project and today it's habitat for thousands and thousands of water loving birds. Also around the dam there's excellent savanna woodland and excellent monsoon forest. The particular habitat of this week's golden bird, the rainbow pitter. Pitta iris, or the rainbow pitta as it's commonly called, lives right here in this tropical monsoon forest on the edge of the Adelaide River floodplain. We're out this morning looking for this beautifully and brilliantly coloured bird with Andy Mortimer. Andy, tell us a little bit about this bird. Uh, he's pretty popular, Australia's only endemic pitta, so the rest you get in New Guinea and Indonesia. Um, quite a popular bird for the birders to look for around here. We've been having a bit of trouble this morning with the nervous 
pitters around this area in particular because not many people come down this track. But uh, hopefully we'll get them later today in uh, right. more, more busy spots. The reason why monsoon forests are prime feeding grounds for rainbow pitters lies right here in the understory of these forests. This thick leaf litter is where arthropods, insects and small animals will hide under the leaves. And the rainbow pitter will walk along the ground tossing these leaves from side to side to get at those little animals. During the dry season, this leaf litter will be incredibly thick due to all the deciduous trees that drop their leaves and in summer, it'll be a little bit more thin on the ground. Out of the three shows we shot in Australia, the quest for the rainbow pitter was undoubtedly the hardest. We came to Australia expecting to find these rainbow pitter fairly easily, and while that was pretty true, we must have seen 20 or 30 different birds, it was a totally different story actually trying to get footage of these birds on the forest floor. <laughs> juvenile really close to the path here we're sneaking up on them searching for the rainbow pitta was a great experience certainly got to visit my first monsoon rainforest so I loved visiting different habitats it was kind of interesting to see how clear the understory was you know there wasn't much vegetation in there but as colorful as the rainbow pitta is it still actually blend in it almost looked black underneath that canopy so being able to find them it was neat it, it actually took a lot of effort to, to get that bird we've just seen three pitters very close to us here. We're sitting next to this quiet brook. One of the best ways to get good looks at these pitters is to sit very quietly and tap in the ground like this. And these pitters are fairly curious. And they'll hear that tapping, they'll think that other birds are foraging in the area, and they'll come in for a closer look. So let's see if this works. Oh yeah, there he is. He's coming closer. See him coming on the ground there. Hopping for a closer look. There he comes. Oh man, look at that. Awesome, great views. These birds are very skulky and wary and it was very tough to get them to sit in one place for any period of time. So we've been looking for this little blighter for two days now just searching through the forest here. We've had very brief glimpses, the birds flying away, we saw a juvenile briefly for a minute, and it's been really, really tough to find this bird. Andy says it's a lot easier in the dry season. We are at the end of the wet season right now, and these birds are very quiet, and they're very tough. But we finally, today, close to Fog Dam, have got just absolutely killer views of our golden bird, the rainbow pitter. Thanks very much, Andy, that was awesome. We just had cracker views of this rainbow pitta sitting in the tree and you can see exactly why it's called rainbow pitta. I mean, every color in the rainbow, we had yellow on it, green, bright blue, nice red in the rump, absolutely spectacularly colored bird, but very cryptic and difficult to find. Our golden bird, the rainbow pitta. It was quite good fun. Uh, I've never had to film the rainbow pitta. I've only had to show people the rainbow pitta. I think in the last two days, we've probably seen 30 to 50 rainbow pitter. I've certainly learned he's a hard bird to film. As you've seen, he's quite common here, and I've certainly learned a little bit about him myself, having spent this much uh, concentrated, focused time with that bird, bringing my knowledge up on the bird. I'll certainly know where to find the uh, more human-friendly ones uh, the next time I've got birders. We've certainly figured that out on this trip. The top end of Northern Territory truly was top-notch. The laid-back and flexible attitude of the people, the stunning scenery and the broad spectrum of bird life made a truly unforgettable trip to Australia. Traveling with BATV was fantastic. It was a lot of fun uh, being able to see the professionalism of the guys, but also the laid back mentality. And I think that really helps 
when you're visiting different people uh, around the country. Uh, it, it kind of uh, takes the stress out of traveling and uh, still being able to achieve your ultimate goal. So it was definitely a learning experience for me. Seeing all these new birds, the only word I can, that comes to my mind is confusing. I definitely didn't have enough time to, to, to study up ahead of time and, and seeing all these different families. Uh, you know, it definitely just uh, being in the field, seeing all this new stuff, it was a great experience. So I'm so stoked that I got a chance to come on this trip. Definitely plan on coming back. The folks at Northern Territory Tourism did a sterling job. We were taken care of like kings, from the excellent food to the logistics of touring around the Northern Territory to finding us these sought after species. Everything was taken care of in a way that couldn't have been better. If you want to visit Northern Territory Australia and take advantage of an exclusive offer for Birding Adventures viewers, log on to territorydiscoveries.com forward slash birding adventures. That's territorydiscoveries.com forward slash birding adventures.